Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Uh, those of you that made the conference, extra thanks. And those of you that didn't come to the conference, you missed out. But there is tomorrow. Um, there will be drinks outside after the, there will be a reception after the, um, free. <laughs> after the, after the, after, after, after the keynote speech. Uh, but for now, um, as the introducer of the introducer, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Penny Edwards. Um, thank you, Thomas, and thanks to all who organized this really absolutely fabulous conference. It's just been an amazing day, and just the thought there's a, another day of this tomorrow. Um, so I last stood here to introduce the speaker in 2013 when I introduced Professor Wang Gungwu, uh, the illustrious Professor Wang Gungwu, who I hear from Jack at the age of 93, just gave four amazing lectures. So <laughs> it's got to be a, a good sign. Um, so I'm giving some hybrid intros. Oh, so let me start from my iPhone. Jack's string of qualifications include mama, not mixed martial arts, MMA, but a double MA, <laughs> from NUS in history and from Harvard in East Asian studies. His string of awards includes the Cornell University Look Sharp Prize. Oh, sorry, Lauriston Sharp Prize. Sorry for his doctoral dissertation, and his first book won the Euro Cis Prize in 2021 for the best book in the humanities. That's the European Southeast Asian Studies Association, and I'll say a bit more about that book in a second. His book manuscript was developed with an Association of Asian Studies uh, award and was later shortlisted for the 2023 Friedrich Weller Prize. Uh, when asked if he would share a fun fact about himself, Jack declined, for reasons you will shortly discover. But the fact is that Jack is just so much fun to be around and a perpetual source of such great energy and generosity of spirit. I am now going to toggle to give a few more um, less fun but very important facts about Jack, who is, as you will all know, a historian of religion. His research focuses on Buddhism and Chinese popular religion. He specializes in Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia and has broad research interests in migration, in diaspora, transnationalism, pilgrimage, and religious diplomacy, which there was a discussion about in the amazing last panel just now. And he is the author of the award-winning book, uh, Monks in Motion, Buddhism and Modernity Across the South China Sea, uh, published by Oxford University Press, a, a really a stellar book and a very beautiful book in its own right. It's beautifully produced. Um, the book was recently translated into Indonesian under the title, okay, I'm going to try. Thank you. Uh, any errors in my pronunciation are down to Daniel's coaching. Kibra <laughs> Para Mahabiksu Agama Buddha Dan Modernitas di Asia Tenggara Maritim. Coming out with <laughs> uh, Karania Press in 2022. And, and that's not enough. A Chinese translation is already underway. Um, Jack has you know, published so many articles in, in many, many journals, Asian Ethnology, China Quarterly, Contemporary Buddhism, Critical Asian Studies, History of Religions, and Journal of Chinese Religions. Um, Jack held a postdoctoral fellowship uh, from the National University of Singapore, but he held that uh, fellowship. We were also delighted uh, to um, benefit from this because Jack held that fellowship here at the University of California, Berkeley in the um, Center for Buddhist Studies, working closely with faculty uh, in Buddhist studies in, in my department, uh, which is South and Southeast Asian studies. Um, so he's not content with uh, you know, all these awards. He's done translations. He's now working on another two books. Uh, so one is Sisters in Dharma, a, po a Buddhist feminist in post-colonial Indonesia. And another is Diplomatic Dharma, Buddhist Diplomacy in Modern Asia. Um, and excuse me while I toggle back one more time to my notes. Ah. We are honored to host you, Jack, and so grateful that you have accepted this invitation um, to uh, present the CSEAS keynote and have made the uh, journey to the West Coast. Uh, to present on Journey to the South, Buddhist Connections Across the South China Sea. Thank you. Round of applause.
Thank you, Penny, for the really generous introduction. And fun fact, Penny was my postdoc advisor when I was here at the postdoc. <laughs> Thank you so much, Penny. And a very good afternoon to a lot of you. Uh, I'm extremely honored to serve as the keynote speaker for the UC Berkeley UCLA Joint Conference on Southeast Asia. I want to take this opportunity to thank Sarah, Noya, and members of the conference organizing committee for putting together this exciting event. Thank you so much. <laughs> and it's truly wonderful to be back in Berkeley, where I spent two happy years as a postdoc at the Center for Buddhist Studies. I'm very grateful to many friends and colleagues for making Berkeley uh, a wonderful home during my postdoc and uh, for their continued support in my career. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, as a Southeast Asian is from Southeast Asia, teaching in Southeast Asia, I want to start my talk today with a little life story. And uh, as what uh, Penny mentioned earlier, yes, uh, I'm going to uh, share this more uh, very soon. Born and raised in Singapore, uh, my childhood experiences and education pretty much shaped my interest in Asian history and Buddhist studies. When I was little, both my parents left me in the care of my maternal grandmother, who was a migrant from Xiamen, China. She was a Buddhist and often brought me to Chinese temples to participate in religious festivals and ceremonies. I learned a lot about Buddhism and Chinese religious practices, as well as Hokkien dialect from her. When I was in high school, which we call junior college in Singapore, don't ask me why, uh, I joined a Buddhist recitation group and learned Chinese Buddhist liturgical chants. And subsequently, my friends and I established the first uh, Buddhist rock band in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, and guess what? We were featured in the local Chinese newspapers, right? So you can imagine how much fun we had. My undergraduate education as a history major at the National University of Singapore further inspired my interest in Buddhism, Chinese history, and Southeast Asian history. That was when I came across Si Chuan Fa's book, A History of the Development of Buddhism in Singapore, or Singapore Fo Jiao Fa Zhan Shi. After reading the book, I was fascinated by how Chinese migration contributed to the spread of Buddhism from China to Singapore. I was deeply inspired to find out about the issues surrounding Chinese Buddhism and the religious connections between China and Southeast Asia, and the rest is history. The Malay archipelago, oftentimes referred to as Maritime Southeast Asia, consists of Muslim-majority Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei, Catholic Philippines, and Chinese Buddhist-majority Singapore. In earlier times, this region saw the rise and fall of several Hindu-Buddhist kingdoms, followed with the arrival of Islam in the Malay archipelago during the 13th century, leading to large-scale conversion of the population to Islam. By the 20th century, Islam is the religion of approximately 140 million people in Southeast Asia, concentrated in the Malay archipelago. Indonesia, in fact, has the world's largest Muslim population. Singapore, where I come from, has stood out in the maritime world of Southeast Asia for its Chinese and Buddhist majority population. Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia during modern times has little or nothing to do with the early Hindu Buddhist kingdom of Sri Vijaya and Majapahit. The majority of Buddhists in present-day Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore are ethnic Chinese who migrated to Southeast Asia or were born to their immigrant parents in the 19th and 20th centuries. Unknown to many, perhaps, a prominent feature in the Chinese migration to maritime Southeast Asia was the dissemination and development of Buddhism in the diaspora. However, the term Southeast Asian Buddhism calls to my Theravada Buddhism, the dominant religion in mainland Southeast Asian states of Burma, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. While Vietnam is considered a part of mainland Southeast Asia, Vietnamese Buddhism, which mostly belongs to the Mahayana tradition, is often regarded as part of East Asian Buddhism, 
which is based on the Chinese language canon and is widely practiced in China, Japan, and Korea. In contrast, maritime Southeast Asia conjures the image of the Malay archipelago, consisting of the Muslim-majority states of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, as well as the predominantly Catholic Philippines. Singapore is deemed as an anomaly because of the predominantly Chinese and Buddhist population, which I mentioned earlier. Scholars of Southeast Asia tend to highlight the cultural and historical differences between mainland and maritime Southeast Asia by emphasizing the religious contrast between mainland Theravada Buddhism and maritime Islam and Catholicism to conceptualize the religious diversity of Southeast Asia as a region. In doing so, these studies fail to recognize the presence of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia and its significance among Chinese communities in the predominantly Islamic and Catholic region. On the other hand, scholars of Buddhism have often limited the study of Southeast Asian Buddhism to the Theravada Buddhist majority on the mainland. For instance, Donna Sharis' seminal work, The Buddhist World of Southeast Asia, that you see on the slide, only focuses on Theravada Buddhism in Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, while Anne Hansen's article on modern Buddhism in Southeast Asia recognizes the presence of a vibrant Chinese Buddhist minority in Malaysia at the end of her essay. In other words, previous scholarship has considered the category of Southeast Asian Buddhism to be almost synonymous with Theravada Buddhism. There are three possible reasons to explain the dichotomy between mainland Theravada and maritime Islam and Catholicism in the study of Southeast Asia. First, this could be attributed to the historiography of writing nation state histories of Southeast Asia. Scholars of Southeast Asian Buddhism and historians of Southeast Asia generally tend to write the narrative of Southeast Asian countries in a linear fashion from early modern Buddhist kingdoms to modern Buddhist majority nation states. The narrative of the evolution of Buddhist kingdoms neglects the Chinese presence and the connectivity of Buddhist monks across the South China Sea. A second reason could be the form of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia. The majority of the Buddhists in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore are ethnic Chinese following Mahayana Buddhism. Therefore, scholars of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asian states tend to come from a background of Sinology and East Asian Buddhist studies and to consider Chinese Buddhism in Southeast Asia as an extension of Chinese Buddhism rather than as Southeast Asian Buddhism. Additionally, many of them publish their works in Chinese, making them inaccessible to scholars of Southeast Asia who do not read the language. Third, and closely related to the second reason, academic boundaries and institutional limitations create a gap between scholars trained in Southeast Asian Buddhism and in East Asian Buddhism. While students of Southeast Asian Buddhism are linguistically trained in Pali and mainland Southeast Asian languages, students of East Asian Buddhism usually study Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and the modern European research language. For this reason, scholars of Southeast Asian Buddhism are equipped with country-specific linguistic and cultural knowledge under the assumption that they will be studying Theravada Buddhism on the mainland. My lecture today, my lecture today will discuss Chinese Buddhist migration in the 20th century. I will also tell the connected history of Buddhist communities in China and maritime Southeast Asia. I will present the intellectual and institutional history of Buddhism in China and in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore through the lives and careers of three prominent monks, Zhu Mo, Yan Pei, and Ashin Jarakita. I demonstrate how their education travels monastic affiliations and interactions with the post-colonial nation state have contributed to the emergence of a few of belief and practice that I call South China Sea Buddhism. By South China Sea Buddhism, I refer to the forms of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia, which use Mandarin Chinese, 
Southern Chinese dialects, and Southeast Asian languages in their liturgy and scriptures that have emerged out of Buddhist connections across the South China Sea. In coining the term South China Sea Buddhism, I draw on M. Blackburn's work on Indian Ocean Buddhism. In sketching out an intellectual case for Indian Ocean Buddhism, Blackburn emphasizes the connected history of Buddhist communities in South and Southeast Asia. I find the idea of Indian Ocean Buddhism, a term that Blackburn used to analyze Buddhist mobility and networks across regions, helpful to my discussion of monastic migration and transregional networks between China and Southeast Asia. I will tell a history of monastic and institutional connectivity in the South China Sea during the 20th century, which emerged due to Chinese migration and to larger forces of social political changes that took place in China and Southeast Asia. My research into South China Sea Buddhism is propelled by three questions. Why did Buddhist monks migrate from China to Southeast Asia? How did they participate in transregional Buddhist networks across the South China Sea? What were the broader implications of these Buddhist connections? In addition to presenting Jumo, Yenpei, Asing Jakita's ideas, activities, and projects, my lecture has two aims. First, to highlight the connected history of Buddhist communities in China and maritime Southeast Asia through synthesizing institutional and intellectual history, as well as local and global history. My focus is how migrant monks acted as agents of knowledge production in the process of selective reformation of Chinese Buddhism by reconfiguring Buddhist ideas through contestation and negotiation. Second, to challenge conventional categories of Chinese Buddhism and Southeast Asian Buddhism by focusing on the lesser known, yet no less historically significant Chinese Buddhist communities in maritime Southeast Asia. I demonstrate that Chinese migration contributed to the spread of Buddhism and the establishment of new institutions in the diaspora. My lecture is divided into four parts. First, I will explore Chinese migration to maritime Southeast Asia between the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, explaining how overseas Chinese came to play a significant role in spreading Buddhism from China to the Malay archipelago. Second, I will examine the transnational career of Zhu Mo, examining his activities and religious spaces in Malaysia during the second half of the 20th century. Next, I will focus on the case of Yen Pei, reviewing how Singapore's Buddhist history was intertwined with the larger history of migration and the modernization of Chinese Buddhism. Finally, I will discuss Asing Jirakita's attempt to make Buddhism less Chinese in order to safeguard the survival of Buddhism as a minority religion in Muslim-majority Indonesia. Large-scale Chinese migration began in the mid-19th century and lasted through the 1930s. This massive movement of Chinese population could be attributed to both push factors within China and the pull factors in Southeast Asia. Qing China's defeat in the Opium War and the subsequent signing of unequal treaties had significant consequences on Chinese migration. In essence, colonialism in Southeast Asia, coupled with the Western opening of China, created mechanisms for moving Chinese labor from South China to Southeast Asia. Chinese migrants were active agents in spreading numerous deity cults into Southeast Asia. For many migrants, the long journey to foreign lands filled them with a deep sense of anxiety and uncertainty, prompting them to turn to religious belief and practices, which not only fulfilled the spiritual needs of the migrants, but also enhanced their confidence and gave them a greater sense of security in their new work and living environment in colonial Southeast Asia. The Empress of Heaven, Tian Ho, also known as Ma Zhu, was probably the most popular goddess in the Chinese diaspora, given her popular regard as protector of seafarers. At the same time, local native place deities such as Guangzhe Junwang and Qing Sui Zhu Shi that were peculiar and important to, to specific dialect groups 
and locales also accompanied the Chinese migrants to Southeast Asia. The overseas Chinese communities worship these deities for a variety of reasons, including others like longevity, fertility, marriage, promotion, and protection. As revealed in a number of sources, overseas Chinese did not distinguish Buddhist deities from Chinese local gods, and they worshiped these sacred images by lighting candles and joss sticks. Many Chinese migrants venerated the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas along with Taoist deities and practiced the Confucian rites of ancestor worship. This form of pre-institutional Chinese Buddhism, which some scholars called the unity of the three teachings of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, was common among the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and furthermore, Chinese merchants, not Buddhist monks, were responsible for running Buddhist temples in Southeast Asia prior to the last decade of the 19th century. The early Chinese migrant monks who resided and performed religious ceremonies in the temples were less educated and could barely understand the meaning and significance of the Buddhist scriptures in classical Chinese. The institutional form of Chinese Buddhism only appeared in maritime Southeast Asia during the last decade of the 19th century. By institutional Buddhism, I refer to Buddhism as an organized religion with a system of teachings, rituals, clerics, and organizations. The arrival of educated Chinese monks in the Malay archipelago contributed to the institutionalization of Buddhism and the subsequent monastery building efforts among the overseas Chinese communities. Moreover, unlike their predecessors who were primarily richer specialists, these new breed of migrant monks who received their monastic training in China were concerned with the dissemination of Buddhist doctrines to the overseas Chinese. Between the second half of the 19th and the first half of the 20th centuries, social political changes in China gave rise to a Buddhist modernist movement which in turn contributed to the making of a vibrant South China Sea Buddhist network. In a nutshell, the Buddhist modernist movement in China during the early half of the 20th century was characterized by reform of the leadership system in the Buddhist monasteries, founding of Buddhist research institutions as well as lay and women's organizations, publishing of Buddhist periodicals, printing and distribution of pre-Dharma books and opening of Buddhist libraries, setting up of Buddhist academies and the promotion of Buddhist charitable activities. These Buddhist reformers participated in the kind of modernist projects as defined by Anne Hansen and David McMahon, making claims of the relevance of Buddhist doctrines to issues of the time and promoted Buddhism based on national particularity. Tai Chi was one of the most prominent figures among the Chinese Buddhist modernists during the Republican period. Born in 1890 in the Chongde County of Zhejiang Province, he became a novice in Jiangsu and received his higher ordination at the Tiantong Monastery in Ningbo. After founding of the Chinese Republic in 1911, Tai Chi spearheaded the Buddhist revival movement or Fu Jiao Fu Xing Yun Dong, and advocated for the need to reform monastic system and promote education. He advocated human life Buddhism, Ren Shen Fu Jiao, to revitalize Chinese Buddhism. His idea of human life Buddhism was aimed at changing the existing image and understanding of Buddhism as a religion for the living to emphasize the practice of Buddhism for this worldly life addressing the social and spiritual problem of 20th century China. Under the abbacy of Tai Xu, Nanputuo Monastery became a headquarters for the Buddhist modernist movement in Southeast China, and it was a key nodal point in the networks connecting modernist monks in Southern China and the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. The South China Sea Buddhist networks were crucial in the transregional circulations of people ideas, and resources between China and Southeast Asia. The religious connections, on the one hand, facilitated the movement of Buddhist monks from China to Southeast Asia 
and fostered the, the dissemination of Buddhist modernist ideas to the overseas Chinese communities. On the other hand, these networks were used to transfer resources from Southeast Asia to fund religious activities in South China. For instance, as the abbot of the Nanputuo Monastery, Tai Chi made three visits to Singapore in 1926, 1928, and 1940 to leverage on the South China Sea networks to seek donations from overseas Chinese to raise funds for his renovation plans for the Nanputuo Monastery as well as to fund his education project at the Mingnan Buddhist Institute. During his first visit in 1926, Tai Chi met with several prominent Chinese businessmen and became friends with Tang Ka Ki and Ao Bun Ho. Tai Chi's friendship with these influential local Chinese leaders demonstrated the significance of the transregional South China Sea networks, allowing him to seek financial support from wealthy business elites in the diaspora and opportunities to preach his ideas of human, human life Buddhism to them. The arrival of modernist Buddhist ideas further contributed to the institutionalization of Chinese Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia during the first half of the 20th century. Taishi had ambitious plans to spread his ideas of human life Buddhism beyond China and wanted to organize an ecumenical Buddhist movement to extend the reach of his uh, modernist project. In September 1926, Tai Chi came to Singapore and gave a series of lectures at the Victoria Memorial Hall, which attracted a large crowd of overseas Chinese. As most of the Buddhist monasteries in Singapore during the early 20th century were disconnected from laity, Tai Chi suggested that the establishment of a lay Buddhist association would be beneficial in propagating the Dharma to the overseas Chinese community. The proposal inspired Ning Da Yun, a prominent Buddhist householder who founded the Chinese Buddhist Association with assistance from Zhuang Dao a year later in 1927. The Chinese Buddhist Association became an important institution for the promotion of Buddhist modernist movement in Singapore by providing education and welfare services for the overseas Chinese communities. By the turn of the 20th century, the development of institutional Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia was linked to and enabled by broader events in China. By the end of the 1940s, there was a larger presence of Buddhist organizations in maritime Southeast Asia. We will now look at the development of Buddhism in the region and the ways in which Jumo, Yanpei, and Ashin Jarakita promoted their respective forms of Buddhist modernism in the Chinese diaspora. Today, many Malaysian Buddhists consider Zumo to be the father of Malaysia's Chinese Buddhism. In 1913, Chen De'an, who became Zumo, was born near the foot of Mount Yindan in the Lecheng County of Zhejiang Province in China. He became a monk when he was 12 and later enrolled at the Mingnan Buddhist Institute at the Nanputuo Monastery, where he became a student of Tai Chi. Following the Chinese Party's uh, victory at the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, many Chinese monks feared communist hostility towards religion and hence decided to leave mainland China. Chu Mo first left for Macau, which was under Portuguese rule, to become the founding advisor of the Macau Buddhist Society. In 1954, he migrated to Penang and remained in Malaysia until his death in 2002. During his five-decade religious career in Malaysia, he served as an advisor to the Pote School, founded and served as the inaugural president of the Malaysian Buddhist Association, established the Triple Wisdom Hall and started the Malaysian Buddhist Institute. In 1998, Chumo became the first Buddhist monk in Malaysia to receive the title of Datu from the head of state of Penang for his contribution to Buddhism and education. He encouraged intra-religious conversion by advocating a Malaysian Chinese Buddhist identity that emphasized this worldly practice of Buddhism promoted a vision of Buddhist orthodoxy 
and establish new Buddhist institution for the promotion of religious education. Zhu Mo redefined the basis of being Buddhist in Malaysia by drawing on Tai Chi's modernist ideas of human life Buddhism. By examining the Malaysian context with the idea of South China Sea Buddhism in mind, we are able to see the connected history of Buddhist communities in China and Southeast Asia. Chinese Buddhist migration has contributed to a redefinition of the concept of being Buddhist in Malaysia and created a Malaysian Chinese Buddhist identity based on the idea of human life Buddhism. When Zumo first arrived in Penang, the majority of Malaysian Chinese knew little about Buddhist doctrines and practiced a mix of Buddhist, Taoist, and Chinese popular religious practice. Furthermore, Buddhism was commonly associated with death and funeral rites. So when someone passed away, they would hire a Buddhist monk to conduct the rituals for them. Zumo advocated for national Buddhist identity based on the principle of human life Buddhism, stressing the need to incorporate Buddhism into one's life, practice orthodox Buddhism that he called Zhen Xing Fu Jiao, and take refuge in the Triple Gems. In other words, he wanted to invent a new definition of being Buddhist for the Malaysian Buddhist community. To promote Buddhist education, Zumo contributed to the expansion of Porte School and, and established the Malaysian Buddhist Association, Triple Wisdom Hall, and the Malaysian Buddhist Institute, which were crucial in disseminating uh, Dharma knowledge and facilitating intra-religious conversion, as he called it, among Buddhist community in Malaysia. And so that was the uh, well-known book that was published uh, by Zhukmo and which was well circulated by the Malaysian Buddhist community known as Buddhism and Human Life. And in this book, uh, we can see how Zhukmo promoted Tai Chi's idea of human life Buddhism in Malaysia, but also uh, in uh, maritime Southeast Asia. And next, I, we will look at uh, Yen Pei. Singaporean Buddhists generally remember Yen Pei as a scholar social worker Mang, uh, responsible for bringing the ideas of humanistic Buddhism or Renjian Fu Jiao to Southeast Asia and promoting them in his lectures, writings, and social activism. Most of his writings were published in, 30, in a 34 volume collection entitled The Collected Works of Mindful Observation and a 12 volume sequel entitled A Sequel to the Mindful Observation, making him the most prolific Chinese Buddhist writer of the period in Southeast Asia. So you can imagine someone who published like a 34 volume work and then after that you know, came out with a 12 volume sequel. So that, that was like really you know, a lot. And of course, uh, nowadays, uh, many libraries do not want you know, so many you know, hard copies. So the thing they will ask you is that, is there an e-copy that you can, <laughs> you can subscribe to? <laughs> Yeah, so Yen Pei was extremely, uh, extremely prolific uh, Chinese Buddhist writer uh, uh, of the period in Southeast Asia where he promoted this idea of humanistic Buddhism. He was born in 1917 into a poor farming family in the Yangzhou city in Jiangsu province of China. In 1929, he was ordained as a monk. Yen Pei was very much a product of the Buddhist modernist movement in Republican China that I uh, talked about earlier. Like many of his contemporaries, such as Zhu Mo, Yen Pei received formal monastic uh, training at Buddhist seminaries, where he was influenced by Tai Chi's vision of human life Buddhism and Ying Shun's idea of humanistic Buddhism. Following the communist victory and the establishment of the PRC, Yen Pei left China for Hong Kong and later settled in Taiwan with his teacher and friend Ying Shun that we see over here on the on slide, and that was uh, Ying Shun, and next to him was the young uh, Yen Pei in Taiwan. So during Yen Pei's uh, decade-long career in Taiwan between 1952 and 1964, he made three visits to Southeast Asia in 1958, 1961, and 1964, where he contributed to the conversations between Theravada and Mahayana Buddhist monastics and established connections with the Southeast Asian Buddhist communities. Yen Pei initially wanted to migrate and spread Buddhism in Vietnam, but was unable to do so because of the Vietnam War. 
1964, he came to Singapore and spent the remaining 32 years of his life building a Buddhist community in post-colonial Singapore. His religious career in Singapore can be divided into two phases. The first as the abbot of the Lingfeng uh, Prashna Auditorium from 1964 to 1979, and subsequently as a social activist and founding chairman of the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services from 1980 to his death in 1996. During the first phase of his religious career, Yen Pei was concerned with the lack of Dharma activities in Singapore. He built a modern auditorium and pioneered activities such as the weekly Dharma lectures, group practices, and Sunday school, which were uncommon among Buddhist organizations during that time. Yen Pei also relied on his networks to make his auditorium a nodal point in the global Buddhist networks, thus allowing him to invite monks from Asia, Australia, and even North America to visit and speak to his congregation. The publication and circulation of his collected works of mindful observation earned him a reputation as one of the preeminent scholar monks of Chinese Buddhism in Southeast Asia. In the second phase of his religious career, Yen Pei became a social activist and founded the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services. He was actively engaged with secular social issues that were of concern in Singapore society. Yen Pei's Buddhist Welfare Services played uh, an important role in promoting elder care and filial piety, organ donation and kidney dialysis, and drug prevention and rehabilitation against the backdrop of a rapidly developing Singapore. Yen Pei preached Buddhist doctrines to not only justify the need for Singaporean Buddhists to be socially relevant and contribute to social welfare, but also went so far as to say that Buddhist teachings could be used as practical solutions to addressing national issues in Singapore. The Singapore government awarded Yen Pei the Public Service Medal in 1986 and the Public Service Star in 1992 to recognize his contributions to social welfare and medical services. Now let us turn our attention to Asin Jarakita. Widely regarded as the first Indonesian-born Buddhist monk, Athin Jarakita took it as his mission to propagate Buddhism in the archipelago nation. Athin Jarakita's Buddhayana movement, which combined the doctrines and practices of Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism, established an inclusive and non-sectarian Buddhist community. He crafted a vision of Indonesian Buddhism that he called Agama Buddha Indonesia as a diverse yet unified religion in line with the motto of unity in diversity of the modern Indonesian state. Later, he introduced the concept of Sanghyang Apit Buddha to make Buddhism compatible with the first principle of the Panchan Sila, the five philosophical pillars of the Indonesian nation during the New Order period. Ashin Jarakita was born in 1923 in Bogo, a city in West Java, at the time part of the Dutch colony of the East Indies. He was given the name Tibon An uh, by his immigrant parents. His early exposure to Buddhism at Chinese temples or Klenting was primarily through chanting and vegetarianism. And according to his uh, biography, his parents did not like the idea of him being a vegetarian. <laughs> Unlike Zhu Mo and Yen Pei, uh, who were born in China, Ashin Jirakita was a Peranakan Chinese born and raised in the Dutch East Indies. He was educated in the Dutch colonial education system and later studied chemistry in the Netherlands. Uh, in 1953, Tibun An was ordained as a novice in Gong Hok Si, uh, in Jakarta by Ben Qing when he was given the Dharma name Ti Zhen. After several months of monastic training, Ti Zhen decided to seek higher ordination to become a bhikkhu. The lack, of the, the lack of the required number of monks for the transmission of precepts, however, made it impossible for him to be fully ordained as a Mahayana monk in Indonesia. Therefore, Ti Zhen planned to seek higher ordination 
in the Chinese Mahayana tradition in mainland China, but was unable to do so as religious activities were restricted under the communist government. Consequently, Tizhen was reordained and received his higher ordination in the Theravada tradition under Mahasi Sayadaw in Burma, who gave him the name Junarakita. Unlike his contemporaries in Malaysia and Singapore, who sought to spread ideas of Buddhist modernism among the Chinese community, Asin Junarakita tried to make Buddhism less Chinese as a calculated strategy to ensure the survival of Buddhism as a minority religion in the world's largest Muslim nation. He founded the, Mah the, he founded the Buddhayana movement that promoted non-sectarian doctrines and practices that he claimed was in line with the national discourse of unity in diversity. The Buddhayana movement conceptualizes Buddhism as a religion within three concentric circles that you see on the slide. The innermost circle is the core teaching or Iti Ajaran, which he claimed was the liberating dimension of Buddhism. The next inner circle is method, which is varied according to the personal capacity and karmic circumstances of the practitioner. Finally, the outermost circle is culture or buddhaya, which he claims make one form of Buddhism seemingly different from another. In terms of practice, Asin Jirakita encouraged a non-sectarian mixing of doctrines and liturgy. He preached that Buddhists should not become fixated on a single sectarian practice and should not consider another approach to be wrong and inferior. On a personal level, Asin Jirakita kept the Theravada precepts of not handling money and not eating after midday, and he maintained the Mahayana practice of vegetarianism. According to my interviewees, he did so to bridge the Vinaya practices of both traditions. Later in the 1980s, he grew a beard to look like a Mahayana elder monk, but continued to dress in Theravada robes. From his personal practice and his appearance, it was evident that Asin Jirakita wanted to stress that he was neither a Theravada nor a Mahayana monk, but a combination of both. Following the 30th of September movement in 1965, Suharto became president and ushered in 31 years of authoritarian rule known as the New Order that lasted until his resignation in 1998. Suharto's government blamed communist China for the 30th of September movement and for its influence over the Indonesian Communist Party or PKI and decided to cut diplomatic ties with the PRC in 1967. The government passed a series of laws and presidential orders to assimilation aimed at Chinese Indonesians and emphasized the Panchan Sila of the belief in the one almighty God, using religion as a force to counter atheist communist influence. Therefore, to make Buddhism compatible with the first principle of the Panchan Sila, Asin Jarakita introduced the concept of Sanghyang Apit Buddha as the Buddhist version of, a, of an almighty God. He claimed that the concept of Sanghyang Apit Buddha could be found in Sanghyang Kamahayanikan, a 10th century Javanese text produced during the reign of King Sindok from East Java. Following Asin Jirakita's rediscovery of Sanghyang Apit Buddha from ancient Javanese texts, he mobilized his disciples from various parts of Indonesia to spread this idea. However, Sanghyang Apit Buddha was a double-aged sword for Asin Jirakita and his Buddhayana movement. On the one hand, the concept was accepted by Suharto's government, thus ensuring that Buddhism continued to be one of the recognized religions in Indonesia. And that's a picture of him with uh, President Suharto. And on the other hand, some Asin Jirakita's followers became critical of his theistic explanation of Buddhism and broke away from the Buddhayana movement. In fact, one prominent uh, Theravada monk told his disciple, and I quote, please tell your teacher that there is no God in Buddhism, <laughs> unquote. In my lecture, I have explored the history of Chinese Buddhist migration, settlement, integration, and networks in the 20th century through two main themes. 
the first concerns the attempt to write a connected history of Buddhist communities in China and Southeast Asia. The other explores the role of Chinese diasporic monks in the making of Buddhist modernism in maritime Southeast Asian states of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. I conclude here with some directions for future research in the hope that more linguistically endowed scholars will pursue further studies on the connected history of Buddhist communities in China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and mainland and maritime Southeast Asia. In the first place, the evidence of Chinese Mahayana and Southeast Asian Theravada Buddhist connections discussed in my lecture reveals that Chinese and Chinese diasporic monks were interested in going to mainland Southeast Asia to exchange ideas and learn from their Pali-oriented colleagues during the 20th century. That is, the South China Sea Buddhist networks linking the Chinese monks to maritime Southeast Asia have also kept the Chinese Buddhists of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore in touch with Buddhist institutions and monastics in Burma, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. There remains much to learn about the patterns of Buddhist circulations in the South China Sea and the ways in which modernist Buddhist ideas and knowledge overlap with and perhaps facilitated one another. Another area deserving further attention is the relations between modernist Buddhists and pre-institutional Buddhist temples in maritime Southeast Asia. As we have learned from the case studies of three prominent South China Sea monks, modernist Buddhists, modernist Buddhists sought to promote their vision of religious orthodoxy by setting themselves apart uh, from pre-institutional Buddhist practices. There were Chinese Buddhists who who participated and moved freely between modernist and pre-institutional Buddhist organizations without having to give up one over the other. Overlapping commercial, clan, and religious ties among Chinese diasporic communities in maritime Southeast Asia may have made it difficult, if not impossible, to have a clear-cut separation between modernist monks and pre-institutional Buddhist groups. How did their collaboration or conflict imp impact the religious landscape in maritime Southeast Asia? Finally, for the time period considered in my lecture, Chinese monks fled communist China and supported anti-communist initiative in Taiwan and maritime Southeast Asia. Some recent and forthcoming works have revealed that Buddhists became embroiled in the Cold War politics of mainland Southeast Asia. Yet, little attention has been paid to the ways in which Chinese monks participated in counter-communist activities or to how they rely on South China Sea Buddhist networks to cultivate activist ties and collaborate with state actors and like-minded Buddhists during the Cold War. Examination of writings of Chinese monks in maritime Southeast Asia, along with Burmese, Khmer, Lao, Thai, and Vietnamese sources from the mainland could help construct a more comprehensive picture of East and Southeast Asian Buddhism during the Cold War. It is likely that a further unpacking of the connected history of Buddhist communities in the region will help us better understand the flow of people, ideas, and resources that shape South China Sea Buddhism. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, thank you very much to Jack. Uh, absolutely incredible to have you here back again, uh, and wonderful for you to thank you. Wonderful of you to agree to this. Um, I know it was a long flight uh, crossing the old South China Sea. Um, do we have any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Jack, for sharing this fantastic research with us. Um, I, I had a question about the Buddhist networks. Mm -hmm. So you showed us some of these really beautiful uh, monasteries and temples. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of wondering where the funding was coming from for to build these. So especially when Yenpei shows up in Singapore, is it that there is a Fujian um, uh, 
overseas Chinese community that's already waiting for a you know new sort of um, Buddhist masters to fund, or does he bring funding with him from his own kind of Buddhist um, uh, background in um, in mainland China? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Uh, that, that is a great question. So, in fact, um, many Buddhist migrant monks rely on the local Southeast Asian Chinese Buddhist communities uh, to build their, their, their to build their, their monasteries. So, uh, for instance, for uh, as you mentioned, the Hokkien kind of connection. So, they were prominent uh, not only Hokkien but uh, other uh, uh, Chinese uh, business elites from other dialect groups that contributed to monastery building efforts in uh, in maritime Southeast. Asia. But not only that, uh, many of these um, uh, wealthy Chinese elites contributed to monastery building in mainland China during the Republican period, and then later contributed to the Buddhist revival in, uh, in uh, China uh, after the uh, reform and opening period in the 1980s. So uh, we see this uh, very vibrant flow of like uh, uh, capital from the Buddhist community from from Southeast Asia to to China, uh, both in the earlier uh, during the earlier part of the twentieth century, but also in the later part of the twentieth century. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Shan. Thank you so much. Really informative and very interesting history. I'm wondering, um, aside from the exchange that was going on from Zhejiang, Fujian over the marine route to, to Southeast Asia. Are there activities going on over land mm -hmm. in Yunnan, Myanmar, that area? Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thank you. Thank you for this uh, really great question. Yes, there were also Buddhist networks uh, between uh, Southwest China, as you mentioned, Yunnan, and the Buddhist community in mainland uh, Southeast Asia. And according to uh, Bing Yang, this uh, network is known as the Southwest, he called it the Southwest Silk Road that actually connected the Buddhist community in Yunnan to uh, mainland Southeast Asia and even to India uh, during pre-modern times. And the, the network uh, remains in the contemporary period. And my colleague, uh, uh, Bei Ying Tern, at, uh, who's finishing a really fascinating dissertation as she's uh, a PhD student at uh, Arizona State University who is uh, finishing a dissertation on this uh, Southwest uh, Buddhist networks looking at the role of uh, Buddhist uh, marble statues uh, trading networks between Burma and uh, Southwest China. And, and uh, according to her, uh, and she has a forthcoming article in the Journal of Global Buddhism, uh, so do uh, check out, I think it will be out soon. That, uh, and in her, you know, in, in, in her uh, research, she actually reviewed that how uh, Chinese monks uh, were actually uh, uh, buying, uh, acquiring like marble Buddha statues from Burma and even brought them not only to, uh, to Yunnan, but also to, to other parts of China, including like Sichuan, Beijing, and even Shanghai. So the, that uh, Buddhist marble statues were in fact uh, very much in demand among the Chinese uh, Buddhist community. So that, that's something uh, uh, interesting to, to, I think, to trace. Another in, uh, important aspect of this connection uh, had to do with uh, the, uh, uh, the Chinese Civil War. In fact, uh, at the, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, that after the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, so there were monks in the coastal region like Zumo and Yanpei, they actually left uh, China to Taiwan and also to Southeast Asia. But there were also monks from, uh, from the Southwest region that actually retreated with the Kuomintang to mainland Southeast Asia. And some of them uh, uh, later migrated to Taiwan. So some of the prominent uh, Buddhist uh, monastics that we know in Taiwan, for instance, like, uh, like Xingdao, who established the Ling Shan, and uh, Zhao Hui Fa Shi, who is the very prominent uh, feminist Buddhist activist. They were actually from Burma before, uh, they were actually from Burma before they actually migrated to Taiwan, and then they are now like bringing like uh, Buddhism, but uh, uh, no, bring uh, resources from the, like, the Buddhist community in Taiwan to build monasteries in Burma. So it's very interesting to, to think about like this uh, kind of connections. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for, for this great question. <laughs> thank you so much, Jack. Since you're here with us in the Bay Area, I hope I don't mind, I hope you don't mind if I ask you a, 
a, a question from an Asian American studies perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your work uh, offers so much to questions that are relevant to thinking about Asian diaspora religion here in North America. As you know, one of the quite interesting debates that takes place both in an academic realm and also in the realm of community activism is what to make of early uh, Chinese religion in the 19th century in, in North America. Um, in other words, what to make of the temples, including those that survive uh, to the present, uh, that could want, in one sense be understood as a kind of uh, Toishanese uh, Taoism, or from another perspective, including the one that you've offered here, a kind of pre-institutional Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But of course, the different historical trajectories uh, that shaped particular southern Chinese migrants here in North America are very different than what you're looking at in maritime Southeast Asia, are very different than even what's happening in uh, mainland Southeast Asia, where there's not this uh, imp uh, this introduction of institutionalized uh, Buddhism in the 20th century. So the, the debate um, that I want, I would love for you to weigh in on from the perspective of your work is how to label uh, Qing religion uh, in mid to late 19th century uh, migrant communities, whether in mainland Southeast Asia or in North America, when often on the altars among all the Taoist deities, there may be one image of Guanyin, but that may be the only image that one might think from a later perspective to be Buddhist. Is it a kind of Buddhist appropriation to think of these temples as proto-Buddhist or pre-institutional Buddhist in some way? What would you make of these questions? I hope, I hope the question makes sense. Thanks so much. Uh, uh Thank you, Tren. Uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think yeah, it's uh, uh, it's interesting to think about this category of like being Buddhist in uh, uh, as you mentioned in the uh, in North America, but also is a uh, kind of a, a new category that actually emerged in Southeast Asia. I would say probably only um, became a uh, and kind of official kind of term and. Uh, uh, and uh, kind of a self-identification uh, kind of uh, category among the uh, uh, the Buddhist communities in, I would say, probably around the second half of the 20th century. So before that, uh, for the Buddhists in uh, Maritime Southeast Asia, uh, you're absolutely right that most of them, uh, most Buddhists did not refer to themselves as Buddhists, right? They worship, like as you mentioned, Guan Ying along with like Taoist deities, practice the ancestral right, uh, practice the ancestral like kind of worship. And uh, to them, being Buddhist or, or rather to practice Chinese religion was mainly this idea of a bye bye. And the, the, the in fact, there's a common phrase uh, among that's used by the uh, Chinese in, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia was this idea of the by the sun door, sun bao yu, right? which means like the more God you you pray to, you know, the more blessings you you receive. So only so during this time, only Buddhists who were like ordained as like monastics were actively considered themselves as Buddhists. And uh, while many most of those uh, Chinese religious practitioners, they are happy to be Buddhists, Taoists, or, or as long as they get you know, the kind of blessings. And during this time. Uh, it, from the 19th century and in fact to the first half of the 20th century, the official category that was used by the British colonial government at the time uh, was actually nation, uh, Chinese national religion. <laughs> and the reason for that was because the Chinese, uh, the colonial administrator thought that since the Chinese could not tell Buddhism, Taoism, or, or kind of Chinese food religious practices apart, so we also should not help them tell the religion apart. So they just label everything as Chinese religious, uh, Chinese national religion. So so um, in the uh, post-colonial period, uh, then the, the category of Buddhism and Taoism became you know, kind of an official category in the national census. But according to uh, uh, some of my colleagues who have worked on this area, they have pointed out that Buddhism, despite being the most popular religious affiliation among the, the overseas Chinese community in Taoist Asia, um, they are not exactly the kind of Buddhist, the kind of so called can, uh, Buddhist practicing the kind of canonical tradition. So, this kind of idea was uh, pretty much kind of adopted from a more monotheistic kind of understanding of religion, where if you believe in one religion, you can only worship that one God and then you can only read the particular set of scriptures and, and so on. So, but many Buddhists, even through the post colonial period and even you know, till today uh, in, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, do not really. Uh, 
no practice uh, or do not really talk about practice what what uh uh, what would be considered kind of canonical Buddhism. And I, I would say that that was a little different from the uh, North American context. And uh, I, I mean, correct me if I'm not, I'm not really an expert on uh, uh, Asian American Buddhism and church and she's, she's, she's uh, the, the, the expert and I learned so much from her work. But uh, from what I know so far uh, about, you know, look, thinking about Asian American Buddhism, I would say that the kind of category, the kind of, formalization of this idea of being Buddhist has a lot to do with more of the kind of the rise of white Buddhists uh, in, in North America when how there's a, this uh, conception of being Buddhist requires a certain you know, set of practice, certain set of understanding of Buddhism. And thus, as, uh, as uh, what Chen Xing and other scholars have pointed out, uh, that how this actually uh, kind of neglected the kind of Asian Buddhists in the kind of Asian American Buddhist uh, discourse. So I think a lot more needs to be done to understand Asian Buddhists. And, and uh, to point out, and to understand Asian Buddhists that arrived um, like much earlier, like what are the kind of understanding of Buddhism, the form of Buddhism they practice, and and many of them probably did not even consider themselves as Buddhist Buddhists, right? That we uh, the kind of category that's being so called imposed on them, you know, uh, in the kind of much later, probably the second half of the twentieth century. So yeah, I, I think this is uh, 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 that we there's a lot more that we should you know look, uh, look into. Yeah, so th thanks so much, uh, Trent. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it was really a blast. <clears throat> it was really a blast to hear you speak. So thank you. Thank I have you. a question about language. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Yenpei and Zhu Mo were born in. I don't remember if it's Jiangsu or Zhejiang or both. Yeah. But uh, Yenpei was yeah. Uh, Zhu Mo was from Zhejiang and uh, Yenpei was from Jiangsu. <laughs> And so my, the first part of my question is sort of on a personal level with these monks, including Ashan Jerakat, you know, um, what importance did they attach to language? Because I'm mm -hmm. assuming Ju, Yenbei and Zhu Mo, you know, didn't grow up speaking Hokkien or any of the really common dialects in Singapore. And then, you know, Ashan, he obviously changed his name at some point from, a, or he it, it chose to adopt an Indonesian <laughs> name. And then the second part of the question is just, um, were liturgical languages and practices affected by contemporary, contemporaneous linguistic policies, you know, such as Mandarinization in Singapore, yeah. that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So thank you. Yeah, th th thank you for this excellent question, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, Yen Pei and Zhu Mo, they actually, they spoke kind of a Mandarin form of Chinese with a very strong accent. So when they arrive in uh, in uh Penang and Singapore, they actually had to get translators uh, to translate their, their sermons from, from Mandarin uh, with heavy accent to, to Hokkien or Cantonese uh, for the overseas Chinese communities. So uh, it was quite interesting to, uh, to, uh, to read their kind of uh, biography and sources. And in fact, uh, Yen Pui pointed out that there was a time when he had to rely on the Teochew translator and the Teochew translator did a really bad job in translating the term Borer, which is like prashna, to Boli, which means like glass, right? So it was like badly translated, and he was really upset with the, with, with the translator. So, and uh, for the second part of your question, yes, it had a lot to do with the kind of uh, post colonial kind of uh, government poli language policy as well. So, like in the case of uh, uh, Malaysia and Singapore, we see the rise of uh, of Mandarin Chinese, especially in Singapore's context with the Speak Mandarin campaign uh, in 1979 onwards. So we see the decline in the use of dialects among the Chinese Mahayana Buddhist communities. And of course, uh, subsequently with the arrival of Taiwanese Buddhist groups, so uh, this uh, the use of Mandarin is in fact now the, uh, I would say, the kind of standard language in the kind of Mahayana Chinese uh, Buddhist community. So it's very hard to find like Hokkien or to, to Jews speaking uh, Buddhist anymore. And in fact, many younger generation of Singaporean Chinese do not speak dialect and they don't even speak Mandarin Chinese very well these days. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's the kind of uh, interesting shift. But for the Indonesian context, it was uh, quite unique in a sense because during the New Order period, Suharto uh, Suato's government introduced the kind of assimilation policy uh, as well 
they were like, targeting like uh, Chinese. So because of that, uh, the Budayana movement could not use Chinese in their kind of, uh, uh, in their riches and in their liter in their liturgical text. So Asin Jirakita, uh, on the one hand, he relied on the Theravada Pali uh, scriptures, right? Because then that's when there's nothing you know, uh, that, uh, that's like in Chinese. But uh, on the other hand, he Romanized um, the Mahayana text into either Pinyin or with the Hokkien transliteration. Uh, so uh, though, uh, from the liturgical text, it's very interesting to see the kind of coexistence between the kind of Pali, uh, kind of uh, Pali, uh, text alongside the kind of transliterated or Romanized like Mahayana text. So this also brings up a, a broader issue that uh, a colleague shared with me, like um, like and as, uh, as uh, what uh, Shu Shu may uh, talk about this idea of your know, Sinophone studies, right? But it's mainly Sinophone study. We think about that in the more of a comparative like uh, literature kind of context. But can we think about like kind of Sinophone Buddhism, like thinking about how Chinese Buddhists rely on different different form of Chinese languages uh, uh, beyond mainland China to, to propagate and to practice Buddhism. So I think this is uh, something that uh, I, I hope future scholars can, you know, can look further into. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. That was a really great talk. Um, I was interested in a comment that you made on um, that um, merchants would run the temples before institutional Buddhism yeah. came through. And I was wondering if that was basically true everywhere. I'm thinking in particular in um, Western Borneo, mm -hmm. where s tens of thousands of Chinese came over um, from you know, the mainland who were doing gold mining in the Montrado mm -hmm. and Mandor areas. And they both Mary Summers Hyde Hughes and Yuan Bingling explain the origins of the kampongs there as basically organized around Hue mm -hmm. and these small temples. And so in a case like that, would there also be some kind of a merchant who was attached to it? Would there be somebody in the community that was settling and then mining and farming there? Do something to do with the with the temples or or were there other other institutional possibilities? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. The Thank you, Nancy. Uh, that is a really interesting question about uh, how um, merchants were actually the ones who established uh, early forms of like so-called Buddhist temples, and uh, which is quite different if we uh, look at that uh, from the Kaftaravada context in the, in uh, especially on mainland Southeast Asia, where it's usually the the monks who who establish uh, monasteries, and in the maritime Southeast Asian context. Um, Many Buddhist temples started off as small shrines, like uh, usually uh, they uh, start off as a kind of a small uh, shrine devo uh, for the Kuan Ying or the Avalokites Flower, which is like one of the most popular deities uh, among the uh, overseas Chinese communities. So, though so they were not actually very much reliant on Buddhist monks in in the kind of establishment of this uh, small shrines that. Uh, gradually uh, expanded to become a kind of a full-scale uh, Buddhist uh, temple. So uh, for the earlier uh, period that before, uh, that I, as I mentioned earlier, before the rise of uh, 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 institutional Buddhism, so these merchants, they were the ones who built temples and they were also the ones who fund temples as well. So, uh, the, so from the time of the temple inscriptions, which is really fascinating, my colleague uh, Kenneth Dean has published like two huge volume of Chinese uh, inscription epigraphic sources from Singapore. And interestingly, from some of the sources, uh, that the inscription revealed that sometimes merchants actually fought among themselves they were unhappy, and then this resulted in like kind of a schism, uh, not in a monastic sense, but between the the the, the uh, business elite and they, how how they split, and then they start another temple with their own with their another business. So it's very interesting to think about the kind of Buddhism uh, before the arrival of the monastics. So for many of these merchants, they hire monks as ritual specialists. So the 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 business elites were the one who were calling the shots because they were hiring them. So they were like basically working 
for uh, working for for the uh, for the traders and merchants. Uh, from one of the colonial records that I I, I, I came across, that uh, there was a case where uh, a, a colonial administrator uh, interview. Uh, I just spoke to some of the monks who were like conducting the rites in in the temple, and they were very curious uh, to know what the monks were chanting, and the monks uh, told told him that they had absolutely no idea what they were chanting. They were just like reciting the, 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 from, uh, you know, from, mem from, mem uh, from memorizing the text, but they had no idea like, about the significance uh, of, the, of the scriptures because they were all like in classical Chinese. So it's very interesting to see the kind of shift uh, by the, uh, the last century of, of, the, uh, of the 19th century and the, uh, and the beginning of the 20th century when this uh, kind of group of uh, educated monks with training, with monastic training, and brought this a new form of like new form of like Buddhist knowledge to transform, uh, kind of like transform the religious landscape in maritime Southeast Asia. I th thank you, Nancy. Nice. Yeah. Okay, apparently we've got time for one last question, and I'm mm -hmm. going to be quite selfish and take it myself. Um, <laughs> I was wondering uh, what role um, the different colonial powers played, as in like did did the was there a sort of a, a, a link between, say, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, or, and then maybe like to a, maybe Cambodia, uh, Laos, that like the, mm -hmm. between the communities there? Was, was that a major part in this as well? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, absolutely. That, thanks for this question. Yeah. The colonial trading networks were crucial for the movement of monks and their resources. So, uh, the, uh, in fact, the Chinese migrant monks rely on the kind of established kind of colonial trading networks from uh, from Southeast China uh, that move like uh, labels, but also like uh, goods from the uh, southeastern coast, mainly like Fujian and Shenzhou, to Southeast Asia. So, uh, and of course, Singapore at the time served as a very important entrepot for the for the British uh, colonial uh, government. So they rely on this uh, kind of colonial trading routes to to bring. Monks and uh, to uh, to maritime Southeast Asia, and at the same time, uh, Theravada Buddhist communities also rely on this uh, colonial trading route. So monks from uh, Sri Lanka, uh, from Ceylon, uh, uh, came to Mar uh, to maritime Southeast Asia, like Malaya, uh, Singapore, and Indonesia for, uh, through this uh, colonial trading routes. So uh, so uh, besides that, uh, also it's important to think about the kind of uh, colonial kind of uh, institution that were created during this time that uh, that actually contributed to the rise of so-called uh, uh, modernist kind of Buddhism. And this had to do with the kind of uh, rise of the modern uh, uh, modernist, uh, quote unquote, modernist Buddhist uh, movement in the, the Theravada uh, Buddhist community in in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Burma, and Thailand during this time, and that actually had an impact uh, on the kind of uh, networks and interactions between Theravada but also Mahayana Buddhist community. So this actually are uh, kind of uh, important to think about this uh, emergence of so-called uh, modernist Buddhist ideas during this time, and this is an area that, uh, as I mentioned to the end of my talk requires a lot of like linguistic uh, language training that in order to do so uh, something that I also have you know, been thinking about is like you know, like your know, humanities uh, scholars tend to work you know uh, individually but I think for this kind of broader kind of global Buddhist kind of project I think it requires a kind of collaborative work you know, to have a group of scholars who are able to read a different range of uh, a different range of sources to, to trace this kind of like Buddhist kind of c connections uh, uh, during the during the colonial period, and of course they do uh, in the post colonial uh, and also the, the post colonial period. Yeah, so yeah, I thought something like yeah, I I, I hope that uh, yeah that future uh, scholars of Buddhism will, will, will be interested to to look at you know, this kind of connections uh, in in Asia and beyond. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, can we have another round of applause for our wonderful speaker? Thank you.